Good morning everybody, welcome to the Galactic History Show. I'm your host Chris Hales and today we have an interesting show. We have uh, Andrew Bartsis on the way to the airport and uh, calling me in, calling back in, in about 10 or 15 minutes time. Uh, really interesting timing unfortunately. Hope everybody can hear me in the chat room. Hi everybody there. I'll say good morning to everybody around the world and everybody who listens to this podcast afterwards. This is going to be another one of those shows where um, it's completely made up as we go along. So this will be interesting. So first of all, a uh, couple of announcements. Uh, the seminar in um, Sarasota in Florida, the uh, beginning of October is still underway for details of that. Uh, you need to look up the uh, In5D website. I'll, I'll fish that out shortly. The um, situation with Andrew is that on fairly much the spur of a moment, they've decided that it's time to hit Los Angeles and talk to some people uh, in Los Angeles about doing a road trip and actually having it um, put up as if you like a reality show, a, a TV show. Uh, that will be interesting, that will be a very interesting exercise. Um, kind of left the show today a little uh, hmm, last minute for me. So this has happened before, will probably happen again and uh, we'll just have to play it entirely by ear. Now, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to remind people is, is um, where to look for things that, uh, that I'm doing. Uh, I have two radio shows going apart from this one per week. It's a radio show called The Repurposing, which occurs on Sundays in the US and Mondays in Australia. There is the, um, long, the Long Conversation on that same channel, which is called The One People's Oneness Radio. And that occurs on Wednesdays in the US, Thursdays here in Australia at this time. Um, whatever time you're listening now is the time that this show occurs. Then there's the Galactic History shows which occur uh, on Wednesday in Australia and, th and that would be Tuesday in America. And then the, the second in, in the series for the week occurs two days later in Australia, that's on Friday and in America that would be on Thursday. Now the, um, the Facebook pages that I'm currently working on are one just one that's just a fan page for myself and the other is in fact uh, called uh, Oneness Radio which is a I think a thing called a group page. So it's actually a um, completely separate thing to the fan page but will actually be both of the both of them will be used to actually put out the information on the upcoming shows now for the long conversation this week um, if my my arrangements hold I'll be having Julian Wells in the first hour and uh, in the second hour we'll be having a gentleman called Anoka Shiva um, he's actually a, po a professor of political science he's semi-retired, actually probably fully retired at this stage. He's actually a, a person who has lived in many, many, uh, well, for the, in comparison to most of us, many alternate communities over the years and always been interested in them and has, has some very interesting experiences and insights into living in those communities. And we're going to have a conversation with him about what makes them work and what makes, what makes them successful from his perspective. So, without further ado, I'll, uh, I'm actually going to uh, pull a caller in and see what's on their mind. We'll take. We'll, I'm expecting Andrew to dial in the show into the show at some time in about the next 20 minutes. He's probably going to be at the airport, and he's probably, hopefully, going to actually have a decent connection, which will be good. Internet's been very problematic for them. Um, it's gone from very good to non-existent and, and back again. Uh, 
Um, partially, I think, because of interference, partially because just the, uh, the facilities where they've been staying have been a little bit variable, shall we say. However, I can see a few people having fun in the chat room there, so we're going to take a call here. What I'd like people to do, we're going to, um, uh, I'm going to ask you to call in. We'll, we'll have some conversations, depending on what's on your mind, and what we'll do is we'll build up a list of questions for Andrew. Specifically, let's, let's uh, focus on 9-11, given that uh, that's coming up for you guys um, tomorrow. It's actually 9-11 for me here right now. And uh, it's actually um, going to be the subject of a conversation that I'm hoping to have um, either this week or next week with a gentleman who's been a 9-11 truther for many years and gave up trying to tell people about it, started writing songs about it. So that will be a, uh, an interesting conversation. So I've had a few people pop up here. So what I'm going to do is work my way through the phone calls and in the chat room, what I may do is um, I'll launch a bigger chat room window here so I can see the questions there. If anyone has a, um, uh, it's just logging on now. If anyone has any questions going that they'd like to put to Andrew, let's start a list. So, area code 785. Hi. Hey Chris, how you doing? It's Carlos again. Carlos, how are you today? I'm good. Um, I just wanted Excellent. to give you an update. I don't know if you remember me or not, but um, we talked about uh, Dr. Stephen Greer's um, serious disclosure. Mm -hmm. And um, well, um, it's a, it's a go. And on September 25th, I'm going to be showing it. So I've been distributing flyers, and, uh, and I got a few people that are interested. So. You know, so it is it is rolling. And yeah, I have, question. Carlos, how big was the town how big was the town that you're in? It was a fairly fairly small area, fairly small town. Yeah. It's uh about eight hundred, maybe, nine hundred people. Mm -hmm. So I've been going to uh the the surrounding areas. Um so and I just been so putting flyers just on, on community buildings and or not buildings, but community boards, and uh, there's a community college not too far from here. So I've been I've been doing that, and other people are helping me, so they're definitely interested. Excellent, excellent. How many people can the theatre hold? Where are you going to show it? Um, my guess is around 180. 180 people. Yep. And are there any are there any nearby towns that you're you're going to as well, or is it um, no, just, just going to be the... I hope the catalyst, you know, just like uh, I hope people will, you know, I, and I think some people are ready, you know, I think they're ready to kind of take that next step into the, you know, into their evolutionary step, you know what I mean, journey. Yeah. So. Is there, uh, are there some schools in, in the town? Uh, just, the, just the high school and the grade school. Have you tried the high school? You might you might find that you get some support from the students themselves because this is this is uh, it's not a um, restricted film, is it? I presume it can be played to pretty much any audience. Yeah, yeah, it can. It's it's not rated R or anything. It just um, I don't know. Have you had, have you not seen the serious disclosure? I've seen uh, about three quarters of it. It's pretty much okay. stuff that I that I had all seen had seen before. There's, for me, exactly. there was not a, not a great deal of new stuff in there. But for someone who's never seen it before, it would be quite gobsmacking. Yeah, uh, but it's all, it's all in information. Like, in a town like this, sorry, in a town like this, no one knows about like UFOs or. Um, I mean, maybe there's like a couple of people I know that like gravitate towards that kind of information, but most of them, you know. Where I'm from, I'm in smack dab in the middle of Christian, conservative, you know, Republican, you know, so it might be hard to, you know, convince people, but, you know, that's that's their way. And Yeah, I think the trick, Carlos, is not to try to convince them. Just put the information in front of them and say, here, you know, I found this really interesting. 
Exactly. You know, the mainstream, yeah. the, just say to them, the mainstream media doesn't always get it right. You know, take a look at this. Right. Exactly. That's probably the best thing to do. You may find the the um, the high school students. You sh you know you, you you mightn't pick up many, but you'll pick up pick up um, those that are really interested. You know, look, I might be misjudging. You might pick up quite a few. Yeah. But I have a feeling. I mean, one of the things that was concerning you is you were feeling quite alone in what you were doing. Right. And yeah, I have I a feeling that you 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 from this from this you should have a. I, you, I would be I would be amazed if you didn't pick up half a dozen people who were reasonably like-minded that you could continue to communicate with. Right. Yeah, and I have found a few synchronicities. You know, had a cousin come from Scotland and haven't seen him for years. And I just returned home, helped parents, and then um, went to this small town restaurant and met someone that I knew, and uh, in Ban you know, a long time ago, and we started chatting, and all of a sudden I said, David Icke is like, whoa, and that just totally, we went through a whole different conversation, that whole night, we, you know, we stayed up until 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning talking about all this kind of stuff, and so, you know, and then I kind of let it settle for a while, what should I do, and then Serious Disclosure came out, and, like, that's the movie I'm going to show, you know, and, uh, and now here I am. And you know September twenty fifth coming pretty soon, so and I'm I'm ready it is. for it. It is. Yeah, look, I mean, for you, for the town, it's actually quite a big event. This is uh, this is the beginning of you know public disclosure for them. And and I uh, I took a flyer to the uh, the newspaper, the local newspaper here. So I didn't get an evil eye look. It just like they looked at the flyer and that was about it. But um, they're going to put it in the paper, so. Yeah, what you could do. Yeah, the, the the serious movie. There's a a number of trailers for it on the internet. You could just encourage them to have a look at one of the trailers. Yeah. Presuming presuming they have an internet connection, which I would imagine that they do. Uh, do do many people in the town actually have and use the internet? Um, I'm quite sure. You know, there's not a lot else to do around here. You know. Uh, the nearest, you know, thing to do is for fun, or like go to Walmart or something. But um, sure, it's it's pretty yeah. uh, like you, you've heard of cow tipping, you know. Uh huh. <laughs> yes, I have. <laughs> It's a local oh. sport. Okay. Look, well, Carlos, yeah. you're doing doing a fantastic job, and and we'll we'll put all our intentions on it having you know being a big night. A right. very big night. So, one of the things to give some thought to is what to do next, uh, exactly. which might be to set up a time and a time and place, or, or at least a mechanism for people to contact you, because I'm exactly. sure it will raise yeah. questions. It'll, there'll be people who are wanting more information. You might, you might think about what you're actually going to do next with um, those inquiring minds. Exactly. Yeah. And there's, I was I mean, like there's Yeah, uh, I was just hoping, you know, like after this, I don't know how many, I'm going to guess maybe 10, 12 people are going to show up, and that's cool, that's a start, and, um, you know, after that, I'm just hoping it, um, it'll spark something under them, you know, and they'll yeah. want to do something about it. I hope so, too. I do. Now, Carlos, will, um, is there anything else you wanted to talk about before we go on to the next question? Um. I just, uh, and you don't have to answer this, just what Andrew can. Um, there's a book called, um, I don't know what it's called, but it's a Dr. Judy Wood, and she wrote about uh, how they use space technology to, to bring the towers down, and I wonder if you have heard of her or if she has a, a different perspective on how they brought the towers down. So that was it. Yep. yep. Uh, that's, 9-11 is something that I wanted to go into today, and... Uh, let me just check and see whether Andrew's popped up here. Not yet. I might try call. Him, but I'll I'll be calling him directly um, at about the half hour if we if he doesn't ring in. So we'll see how that goes. Look, Dr. Judy Wood's book. I think it's called Why Did the Towers Fall? Um, I've heard many interviews with her. Seen the uh, material that she's got on the internet. She puts together a tremendous case for. Uh, 
right, the, the key thing it does is it absolutely questions the official view. Exactly, okay, yeah. it, and it pose, she poses many, many, many questions. Um, you know, as a scientist, she recognises she can't absolutely answer the questions because access to the to the crime scene, if you like, is impossible unless you're a time traveller. And the explanation that she gives is far more cogent than anything has, uh, that you'd ever see in the mainstream media. It's you know because it looks at it from a very, very critical perspective. It looks absolutely at, at what happened. From from you know her keen eye, the photographic evidence that she had all has also assembled is actually very good as well. She's got a large collection of photos and videos, and uh, the one that's particularly compelling is for me is one of the top of the tower as it collapsed. And if you watch, you know, you don't even have to watch particularly carefully. If you watch what happens to the big steel beams that are left exposed for the last few seconds before the, the tower really starts to plummet downwards, they actually literally turn into dust. And you can ah. see them so you can see the dust just fall away. You know, and these are steel these are full on you know the the core beams are actually the, the, the uh, central support beams for the entire structure run out, running up through the centre of the building. So the things the lift wells I think were built in from memory. And those things just don't turn to dust. Uh, and of course, you know, we could have a, a, long, a long discussion about the other things that she found, uh, the other, uh, other evidence of, of advanced technological attack that she found on the scene around, through photographic evidence and through some, some video evidence, and, and I think she did some interviewing with people who were there. Uh, a very, very fascinating book. And she's done a lot of interviews. She's done at least a couple of interviews with Veritas Radio and probably many others uh, over the last years because she's been doing this for a long time. So I'd certainly given that 9-11 is, is um, on everybody's mind on this date. Uh, if, if you want to point anyone at a, at a, at a very, very, um, if you like, scholarly work on 9-11, hers would be a great one to point to. And the other one is the, um, the group called uh, I think it's um, Architects for 9-11 Truth, yep. or Architects, yeah, and, and their work, they've, they've, got, um, they've got, I think they have multiple websites up, uh, they actually put up a billboard in, I think it was in Texas, very large billboard, and all it said was, did you know, that something like, did you know there was a third tower that fell in 9-11, referring to Building 7, because what's... Uh, What's become clear is that many, many people do not know that there was a third building that fell down. And not that it wasn't as high as the other buildings, it was a much lower building, a much, uh, you know, far fewer floors. But it was not struck by anything, um, anything to damage it to the extent that it needed to fall down. And again, it was another, it was built the same way as the, the main buildings. It was a steel beam type construction. Those buildings don't fall over unless they're demolished. And you only have to watch the footage. Now you're looking at a demolition. So the 9-11 um, truth movement has a huge repository of information that it's actually put together over the you know, 12 years since that event. And the, uh, the, the sum total of the human thought that's pouring out about that is enormous and it's going to take another boost. Every time we hit this date, it takes another boost because people re-look at it. So, Carlos, I'm, I'm really hoping that one of these days, one of these days, it will be publicly acknowledged that the official explanation was false. Andrew's information about it is very interesting. There's a series of videos that are being published on the internet that everyone needs to, to have a look at if you're following along this information. The, uh, these are the interviews done by Lance White, the zany mystic, with Andrew at Mount Shasta. And there's a series of 20. I've actually seen about 12 of them, and I'll catch up with the rest of them this week. It's, um, it's again, it's, it's um, an expansion of what came out during those three initial interviews that he and I did on walking in energy. Some areas are, are new, some areas are just, are just in there with more detail. 
but the sum total of that is that the um, the information I'm actually just dropping onto YouTube at the moment so I can pull up a web address to find that because I don't recall the name of the um, of the actual channel that it was on. I was talking to a gentleman last night, Carlos, who's uh, displayed all of the symptoms that Andrew was actually talking about when he says some people have trouble with the information. He was having to listen to things many, many times to actually absorb the information. Uh, these videos I've found I think are actually probably a, a little a little easier on that aspect than some of the radio shows we've done which have been extremely intense. How do you find them Carlos? Do you find them you have to keep going back and, and re-listening to parts? Yeah, um, uh, you did it about two weeks ago you guys did a show with uh, Andrew Teal, he was you and um, I can't remember the other person and once Teal and Andrew got on, I was asleep in 15 minutes. I was just so tired, I couldn't go anymore. And his radio shows, when I was on the first time, um, he, he gave me the explanation of my question, and I just totally, it, it, it took me back, and uh, I had to listen to it two times. So, yeah, yeah. I have the, he has that effect, and even I just started watching the uh, YouTube thing, and um, it is easier, but... There's just some, somehow it's just like I get this, some weird feeling or something. So it is, it's, it's cool and uh, it's, uh, it takes a lot to download, but um, the information sounds, is resonating with me and uh, I definitely feel like it's more truthful than even some of the other stuff that I've read and come across. So. Indeed, indeed. Um the video channel is actually called Creating 5D. If you look up Creating 5D on YouTube, you'll find Galactic History Parts 1. Looks like they have up to um, at least Part 15. I'll just check the actual site. No, I'm seeing Part 20. So it looks like they've got the whole series up there now, which is excellent. Uh, they're, they're Go ahead, Carlos. Did they? I'm sorry. Um, did they say that on on Tower Seven wasn't there like a command center on the top, and that's why they destroyed it, or is there another reason for it? Ooh, several reasons that I've that I've uh, heard on that. Uh, right. There's always many many reasons. There's always more than one reason for these things happening, and yeah. the uh, uh, the explanations for for Tower Seven were that. There was a massive amount of gold stored in the basement. Reputedly, the gold that uh, that Kennedy actually borrowed, if you like, that is President John F. Kennedy borrowed back in the 60s from the trust in Indonesia that was run by um, Sahato, President Sahato over there, who who actually uh, was trustee of this enormous hoard of gold and actually allowed Kennedy to take some and use it to... Was, Kennedy's plans were to reboot the financial system of the United States. That's one of the reasons why Kennedy was killed. And, and they are related, they are in fact related incidents. They reach back through time to the time of Kennedy. Now the, the other aspect of it was that apparently there was an enormous amount of um, paper evidence that was stored in the building as to you know nefarious dealings by the the um, high end of the cabal, which they also conveniently um, destroyed when the building went down. So, gold heist, uh, covering up evidence, are the two main reasons I've heard for Building Seven's uh, demolition because it was a demolition. It's absolutely clear it collapsed the building. Have you ever seen the the, the Tower Seven footage? The, the I Building have, Seven yeah. footage. Yep. Yeah. Looks, does it look like a demolition to you? It looked like something. It looked like a, I mean, plane didn't go into it. I didn't buy the whole thing anyway, you know, so. But, um, no, and, no. And it's... that news footage of the BBC news reporter that was reporting that the uh, tower had fallen, but it was still behind her, you know, and it was still up. Mm -hmm. So Yes, that, that was an oops, a big oops. 
and this, the, that is such a well-known incident. Um, I'm, I really hope that there's actually a good piece of footage of that on YouTube. I've never actually attempted to find it, but it's probably out there. So, and if you do find it, it's something that's worthwhile showing to people because a lot of the time, Carlos, you only have to show them one little piece of information that raises enough questions that uh, the walls come down for them. Excellent. So, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, you go ahead, Carlos. That's okay. I went back to school for just one semester. I thought I could handle it, but I couldn't. But I took speech class, and one of my speeches was for persuasion speech. And mm -hmm. I talked about I, I talked about the Pentagon and the and the airplane that didn't hit, you know. And of course, mm -hmm. people were rolling their eyes. It was like, no, that's not true. And then I showed them the evidence, and like after after the speech, and it was only a 15 minute speech, so I had to cram in as much information as I could. And I, I did start turning some minds, so hopefully I planted some seeds in about 15 people, you know. Mm -hmm. So when this information cool. comes out again, it's like, holy cow, that guy was right, you know, or, or he had that information. Well, that's actually what will tend to happen. They'll tend to come looking for you when all this stuff really finally starts to break through the mainstream media. That was at the local high school? Uh, no, it was at... Um, in Kansas City, because I lived on the other side of the of the state in Kansas, and we had you know bigger towns and everything. I lived in uh, a place called Lawrence, and I decided to go back to school, um, see get get a major in history or something. But it didn't work out for me because I just couldn't. You know, I was in a different vibration or something. Because you know, after reading, you know, David Icke, Michael Desarian, and all them guys. You know, going back to school and learning stuff that I learned in high school just didn't—it didn't appeal to me. And um, but I just did that one thing, that one thing, you know, that I did. Maybe that was my purpose all along, you know, in the in the high scheme of things, you know, to kind of plant some seeds that way too. So. Yep. Yep. I know exactly uh, how that goes because I know many people who just didn't make it through high school at all. They never actually um, connected with the way that education was being presented. And they always felt the information that they were receiving was manipulative. And, you know, they, this, people will express it differently, but because the, the, the education system isn't really an education system, it's not really in trying to teach you how to think, it's just trying to teach you what to think and when to think it. Yeah. And as a, you know, it's trying to turn out the kind of people that will will you know acquiesce to the system that we're in. Uh, it's it's not really about training people to have fine minds, which is you know that's what we're sold as education, but well, that's I actually kinda, not what's not what's happening. I call it the indoctrination factory. You know, they just kind of oh, you know, well, it it's is. a factory. You know, it just. And in fact, the, uh, if you look at the way that the actual education system unfolds, you, you are taught to, to line up, uh, don't, question, don't question authority, um, you're taught to remember things and regurgitate them and, and you know, other, other things that really work, work for the system to create people who will be absorbed into the industrial aspect of the system so they can function inside the, you know, the production um, companies and facilities that, that, that we all actually operate in. You know, that's essentially what it's working. And there's a whole range of levels in that, right, right through from the people who actually do the, do the hardcore physical things through to those that administer. But the mindset is all the same, the acquiescence to a higher authority. It's a, it's, it's a training in hierarchy. It's the way I've become to perceive the education system for the most part. When you move into university, it certainly becomes more, um, more academic and more knowledge-based and more informational-based. But um, there's an aspect of universities which are also used to filter, um, you know, I'll be blunt, they filter psychopaths to the top. You know, they filter people through who are quite, quite um, happy to trample on others 
for yep. you know whatever whatever purpose motivates them, and it's it's this incredibly competitive aspect that's brought in, and uh, you know alongside a strong a, again a, a strong line of you know pursuit of academic knowledge, but it's the actual pursuit of academic knowledge is is in in and of itself controlled, the actual things that you're allowed to research are controlled, so the um, end result is that we don't have the educational system that's required to advance this planet. We, it's, it's all about advancing the system and not the people. Um, I have a specific view of the system which I've been developing for some time, well, when I say developing, I'm trying to develop a methodology for talking about the system to people who are interested in listening. And, and this is, in fact, what I'll do, Carlos, what I'm going to do is I'll, I'm going to whip through um, the, the other callers and because uh, I've, I've realized um, that there's one specific thing that I can talk about today that I really want to get out there that you guys would find useful in the conversations that we're going to have with others over the next period of time about what the system really is and how it's always worked and it's a, a an explanation which doesn't really require you to go into a lot of detail. You don't necessarily have to start talking about things like 9-11 you know, unless, unless people have been, you know, there are some who are so asleep they, did, they barely noticed that 9-11 occurred so they're tough but it's a view that allows you to offer an explanation of why the world's so crazy. It looks like it should work but it doesn't. So um, I'll work my way through the rest of the questions with the callers first and then we'll have that discussion. So hang in there, Carlos, because you'll probably find it very useful. All right. Thank you. And uh, it, is, it is a bit different. I've been talking about it on air in, on a little radio station in, in South Carolina and uh, this is the, the sort of the, the process that we've arrived at. So Carlos, I'll pop you back on hold. And just for those in the chat room, I have been writing down the questions that I'm seeing and... Uh, I'll, uh, okay, question. Ooh, Rackmeister's posing something here that I'll have to read a little more carefully. But the questions I've had from the chat so far, one was about ringing in the ears. That's actually a good one because I do have that myself and uh, would find it very interesting to know whether it's um, related to anything special that's going on. Um, secondly, was about you know when we ascend, where do, where do we go to? Uh, that's probably not a simple question to answer. Uh, the third question was about Dr. Judy Wood and and how closely her explanations align with what Andrew sees in the Akashic. Another interesting question. There is some conversation about 9/11 on the uh, video series that I've just been talking about, but um, not in a huge amount of detail. What, what I was hoping to do with Andrew was to go through 9-11 go through in some detail, uh, the three main aspects, the, the towers crashing, the Pentagon attack and the other plane that was downed some distance away. Um, they all require some attention in and of themselves. So I'm going to pull in the next caller. How do you put it uh, in there now? Hello, area code 727. Hello, area code 727. Oh, right here. Oh, I'd say that it sounds like there's another conversation going on there, so we'll try the next caller. Okay, area code 204. Could we have your name and your question, please? Hi, my name is Joanne. Chris, I'd like to thank you, Andrew, Nikki, and Julian for the wonderful work that you all do, your generosity of spirit, and your dedication to service to others. And I have a couple of addenda to some recent uh, programs. Uh, the first was the uh, phenomenal uh, interview that uh, Andrew, you, and Teal presented. Um, and it's about the uh, expanding exposure to Teal's art. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, I think the idea of using the posters, uh, the billboards, and the newspapers is awesome. And my, uh, the other observation I might like to add is using stickers. I don't know if this would be viable or not, but uh, stickers are great because therefore 
with stickers you have mobile uh, billboards. Uh, the type of thing that could be placed upon backpacks, purses, laptop cases, luggage, and even bumper stickers. Sure. What do you think? Yeah, I think I think it will work. Um, I think the there needs to be probably a, um, a minimum size, and so, something would have to actually ask Teal about, so that uh -huh. so that the de the detail was big enough to see at a glance. Uh -huh. One of the things that she, one of the things that occurred to me was is if you were writing, um, sending information to in any aspect of the system, you could actually include one of these things at a four size, which would be um, you know the letter size that um, mm -hmm. that is used in the U.S. Uh, a4 is a is a, a European standard, which is actually used in this country, which is why it's the first thing that popped out of my mouth. But at that size, the detail in her imagery would be big enough to see at a glance. Now, as you shrink that down, might become less effective, but yeah. absolutely, so bum bumpers. We spend a lot of time looking at the back of the car in front of us. Mm -hmm. so, no, I was thinking too also more of the idea of a, a laptop uh, uh, cases and backpacks because backpacks are great because they hit university campuses and schools and mm -hmm. uh, laptop cases hit airports and also luggage. So um, pick the idea around and again with uh, the idea of size, um, if it would be appropriate, that would be a really great way of, uh, of getting this out uh, literally globally. And in addition, these are the sorts of things that once things get rolling could possibly be mailed out to other, uh, uh, other countries. I'm calling in from Canada, uh, so we're right next door to the United States. Uh, but it would be great to be able to initiate something like that at a global level. It would be, in fact. The, um, the idea of having the artwork in small sizes, it just occurred to me that, that even to see it at a small size, even if you couldn't see the detail, uh -huh. you, they're such they're such eye catching images that if you they if are, you if you saw it at a if you saw it at a small size from a distance, um, and then ran across one that was larger, you would remember it. Hmm. Yeah, they're uh, very distinctive. Of their, the, extremely distinctive. There is, I have seen a little bit of artwork um, that is similar, a little bit of the sacred geometric sacred sacred geometry artwork um, from a few websites I've seen is similar, but. Uh, Teal's work stands out as being quite unique. In fact, I thought they would make absolutely lovely stained glass windows mm -hmm. when you, the when you look I'd, at the form of them. Yeah, and I don't know if this would work or not. Uh, Andrew probably would uh, because of the, uh, the, the whole impact of color. Um, if, if these images could be trans, uh, transmitted electronically, I'm thinking more like the background to a computer on a computer screen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, like desktop um, and that sort of thing. I don't know if that would work or not because sometimes you need uh, the actual print for the impact of the color to make uh, um, um, the needed connection to the uh, human senses. So I don't know. But that's something else to look into. It is. I just, uh, you know, there's a lot of television shops mm -hmm. and shops, shops that sell lots of computers and they play screen shows all the time. Mm -hmm and people wander around these shops looking at them. You know, if, if anyone is working, working in a business like that, uh, they could actually have, make up a screen show of, of Teal's artwork because there are the images that are on her website are actually good enough quality. You can download them and they're good enough quality uh -huh. to use on the screen show. So anyone who's listening who wanted to do that, you could actually simply leave it playing. The other place yeah, you could actually do that is um, you know shopping centres, uh, malls. They uh, in this country anyway. There's there seems to be a, a proliferation of large screens being used for advertising. In fact, uh, that's something that most of the malls would actually, you know, it would cost. You'd have to pay for it. But it may be a case of you know if there's funding available for this process, there could be screen shows playing in pretty much every mall in every country that has the facility if we if we could if we could put together enough money for it that would be good because they're, they're actually the other thing I quite often uh, you know about five feet by two feet they're quite big yeah no the other thing I was thinking of is uh, you know like screensaver types of images on uh, on the on computers and to be able to transmit them via email or co transmit connections um, because you're viewing audience, I mean, one person emails another, emails another, and so on and so forth, and it goes viral. So whether or not that yeah. sort of thing, again, 
the, the, the impact of the, the, the color on the screen as opposed to the color printed, if that uh, would have the same uh, visual impact and the uh, same um, mental awakening effect, it's something to explore. It's a question for Teal, if the color is critical. No. I suspect, I suspect um, the form is more critical than the color. The yeah. anyway. relationship, it's the, it's the colors relative to one another that, that actually, you know, are responsible for creating the form. So provided the colors aren't too dull, uh, dull and lifeless, I think, the, I think the effect would be there on pretty much anything you, you actually put these on, whether it be a TV mm -hmm. screen, a laptop screen, or even some form of, of printed output. For instance, my, I've got a little uh, inkjet printer. It's not huh? a wonderful color. It's not a wonderful color printer unless you unless you put gloss paper in it, and even at, even on plain paper where its color performance isn't that impressive, there's still enough of the original feel there, I think, for it to work. But uh, you know, it's a great project, and I'm really looking forward to it to it pushing forward. So, uh, Joanne. Mm -hmm. Yep. Was, uh, did you have? You go ahead. Yeah, okay, no, I was just going to say possibly those are ideas you could run by Teal and Andrew. They are indeed. They are indeed. I have to actually communicate a few things to Teal, so that's actually on my list. Great. Was there something, okay. else, something else you wanted to talk about? You said you had a couple of questions. Yeah, second addendum, and I'll be brief because I know you've got other callers and you want to get a hold of Andrew. Uh, this was uh, the discussion you had last call with Nikki about the owner's manual for the human body, which I think oh, yes. is absolutely awesome. Uh, yes. the, um, I, uh, I believe that a number of your uh, listening audience are like workers uh, with a small L as opposed to a capital L, and by that I mean not engaged in professional energy work. Uh, what uh, your listeners might find very useful uh, on a daily basis is using muscle response testing, and that's something everybody, just about everybody can do to determine what are healthy choices and uh, less healthy choices for the body. And there's tons of information about that available on the Internet, so anyone who's not familiar with that can easily check that out. Um, but uh, muscle response testing is very useful for uh, determining things like allergies, uh, determining things like food sensitivities. And for those uh, listeners who uh, are able to access the Akashic Records on their own, uh, if you're able to read the Akashic Records, using the two things in tandem are awesome because the, uh, the records are such a wealth of information uh, and it's uh, something you can use as a very useful tool to customize what works for your body and helps your spirit on this journey. Any, any websites you can recommend? Uh, for the uh, muscle response? No, mm -hmm. I didn't. This is something um, I would say maybe just type in muscle response testing on YouTube. Uh, and see uh, what comes up. Uh, I've been using muscle response myself for a number of years uh, and uh, we sort of fine-tuned it. Uh, initially I got information reading uh, um, uh, uh, Stephen Hawkins and mm -hmm. I also did, uh, I had some allergy work done for me uh, using uh, the NAET protocol, N-A-E-T, and that's with um, dealing with allergies. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's the, the sort of thing that um, it, uh, it can be used virtually anywhere, um, and uh, just by simply asking yes or no questions, it's basically the same thing as using the pendulum, but you don't need to use the pendulum, you're simply using your body. So it's dowsing, uh, so the dowsing, we just yeah, describe uh, it as similar dowsing. to that, uh, not quite, not quite. You simply make a statement, uh, for example, uh, hold, if you can hold the item close to your solar plexus, that works the best. Uh, this, for example, um, I can consider this food is a healthy choice for my body. And uh, just see which way your body moves. If your body moves forward, it indicates a yes answer. If it moves backwards, it means a, a negative answer. And it shows that you're, what food you can tolerate. Mm. So that's so basically like, like a one sentence description. Um, mm. But uh, you obviously you need to, it's the sort of thing that needs to be um, developed and practiced a little bit. Um, but uh, my husband and I also we, uh, have been able to, to check our own Akashic records and we've used the two things together because sometimes we'll get some information um, that may not be quite as detailed as we need and you know, we need to basically fine tune it and the two things together help very, very much. And uh, for example, um, 
one of the comments that Nikki made, uh, she was listing a number of foods that were very, very beneficial. And I, I believe one of them was Swiss chard. Yes. I don't know if you remember that. Yes, yeah, Swiss chard, it's a uh, okay. form of lettuce. It's a form of lettuce, I believe. It's full of all sorts of things. However, Swiss chard it also belongs to the same group of vegetables as spinach, spinach and beet greens. And mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're a very concentrated source of oxalic acid. And this compound binds with calcium. And also this can lead, to, in some people, to kidney stones. Now that's something I didn't know about me, but I just, when I was reading the records, I asked about that. And found out that uh, it's okay to eat, but not eat them on a regular basis. In other words, it's not the sort of thing I, I can eat every day. Maybe once a week or twice a week, depending on the amount. Um, so it's the sort of thing that it's, um, we are responsible for our own bodies. And that's the bottom line. Uh, every, we, in, in today's society, we're all looking for um, a quick fix. And we're looking for something that's easy and mainly convenient and easy that we can uh, um, not necessarily have to think it through ourselves. But it is really our responsibility to look after what goes into our mouth. And Absolutely. sometimes that takes a bit of, yeah, and it takes a bit of planning and a bit of forethought. And uh, it simply takes, um, a, in some cases, a little bit of digging and a little bit of research. Because you've got to have the motivation to find out what works for you. You can't take what, uh, um, uh, what is simply put out on the mainstream and say, this is good for you, this is good for you, this is good for you, uh, because um, I'm a, a baby boomer raised in the 50s, and the 50s the thing was, oh, you don't breastfeed your children, uh, you, teach, you, you put them on formula. Well, that's, you know, that's what the experts said, and that's what a generation of mothers did, and uh, not the healthiest, healthiest thing. So it's the sort of thing you have to uh, put yourself in the driver's seat of, uh, of your own vehicle. Absolutely, you, and you just you nailed it very well, actually. There, Joanne, the the um, knowledge is something that you have to key yourself into. You have to put a bit of effort into growing your knowledge about your body, and then you have to actually do. Uh, you have to take action, and you know we're not talking about anything spectacular here. We're just talking about following through and consistently, um, you know, buying foods that will will do what they need to do for you. Um, taking the time to prepare them and paying attention to your body I think is a really key thing. We don't pay enough attention to how we're actually physically feeling and if you attach a value to, our, you know, if it's really valuable for me to actually feel really good, you know, if we attach enough value to that and prioritize it properly, yeah, we will be a lot healthier and that includes exercise too. It's, it's, um, the diet is part of the equation, the other side is actually you know, physically uh, engaging the body because it needs to be moved. It needs to be um, put under put under pressure literally daily to actually you know to make sure that the cell changeover that's supposed to take place does because it's all about maintaining that metabolism. So energy in, energy out. Um, in terms of food that you take in and and physical work that you do. It's all part of a big equation. Again, not something that is emphasized enough at schools. Yeah, that's it exactly. Okay, well, thank you very much for letting me uh, share that information to the listening audience. And hopefully uh, uh, there'll be some food for thought that people can apply to their own lives. Yeah, great thoughts. Thanks, Joanne, for joining us. And, thank you uh, we'll, we'll hopefully hear from you at some future. We'll hear from you at some future point. I sincerely hope so because I have some questions for Andrew, but I'm not going to monopolize the phone because you've got other things to do and the information, um, the questions I have can wait for another time. No, Thank you. No problem. Thanks, Joanne. Bye for now. Excellent. Now, um, not seeing any extra questions to read out from the chat just at this point. So we'll move on to the next person with their hand up, which is area code 951. Hi, could we have your name and your question, please? Area code 951. Okay, they are probably just listening, so we'll pop you back on hold. And let's try area code 612. Hello, could we have your name and your question, please? Hi, Chris. It's Elizabeth. How are you? I'm good, thanks, Elizabeth. How are you doing? Okay. Awesome videos, 20 videos. I watched them all. 
they're just they're awestruck, abounding videos. They're really, really good. Chris, you're going to enjoy the rest of them. They get better as they go. I mean, they're all cool. Good, yeah, that's very that's very cool. Actually, I started on them last week, and I was kind of moving through them, and then uh, several things jumped up locally here that were going on that took my attention away. And uh, um, I actually I had, there was actually only twelve up there when I worked my way through them, and now that the other eight are up there, well, I guess I've got something to do while I'm working for the next few days. But it well, was really uh, it was really. Um, uh, a nice flow of information I felt, uh, a little more yeah. paced than the the audio interviews that we've been doing. Lots of to me, there's lots of new information. Although there's lots of the information that we know is expanded on, and it expands you, <laughs> expands your mm. vision. Yeah, yes, it does. It's really good. And I just wanted yeah, to whole... address you know how you have people having to listen to it over and over. Mm -hmm. You know what? This is how much brainwashed everybody can know that they're brainwashed it, because I do that too. I listen to a 25-minute one. If I get to a point, a part where I don't quite understand it, but I understand it and I want to get some more of the detail, I'll just put it back mm -hmm. a minute or two and re-listen to it. Sometimes I re-listen to that part five times, <laughs> you know. But, um, you know, that's a big clue as you're listening to them how much brainwashing has to come off of us. It's really, really good. It's a good, it's a good sign that um, they're making a very awesome impact inside yourself, you know? Well, the, the programming that, that we've all been subjected to for our entire lives is so profound. Uh, you know, even, even people uh, who would consider themselves quite completely deprogrammed and includes me, you know, we slip back into language, which is programming language. We slip back into responses that are programmed responses and because it's just so deeply innate and you, you have to consciously correct yourself. You'll find me, at, you'll, and you'll probably have heard this on the radio, where I'll correct something I've said because, you know, it's just, it's just a completely an old paradigm reaction. Poof, comes out, you know, and just pops right out before you before you can even, you, you know, you tend to self-correct. You can feel these kind of, you can feel these responses coming on and just stop them and, you know, make a choice. But sometimes they just pop straight out. It is incredibly profound. When you look at what's been done to us in, in terms of the um, degree of effectiveness of the control system, the domination and control system, as Andrew puts it, it's brilliant. They did a fantastic uh -huh. job. In, in it's actually, but, yeah. mm, but it, you know, brilliant in a negative way because it's not real. It's it's a construct. In fact, did, have you heard the interview between? Um, well, I wouldn't call it an interview between an interview. I'd call it a conversation between Teal and Andrew, where I was I was present and facilitating to some degree because it was um, you know, a lot of the time it was yeah. um, a case of stand back and just let it happen. Yeah. Um, they they are um, oh, no I've lost my, I got so stuck on that I've lost my train of thought. Uh, if you listen to that call, uh, there are various points where they they talk about the control system and and what it's done for us and the fact that uh, at a higher level, at the highest of levels, if you like, it's it's all part of an educational process, and you know it's it's. If you, were, if you actually reach that point, and it takes a while for people to reach that point where they, where they can dig out of the emotional responses that the system has actually taught them and view it from the perspective of, okay, we're consciousness having a journey. We've undertaken this experience, and in order for, in order for this experience to actually be the experience it needs to be, then the negativity has to be present. And that yeah. we, we, in the end, if we're, as, we, as we exit this situation, we have to remove the, the judgment that follows the emotional response in order to get the perspective required to learn the lessons fully. Because the, the lesson in the end is, is if, you, if you want to take the, le the lessons coming in layers, 
the lessons the lesson in the end is that in the journey of consciousness there there is a need to experience all in order to to move forward and uh, that, I mean that that's a difficult spot for a lot of people to reach because they're, well, they're so stuck the in the emotional so, response end. Yeah, the brainwashing plan was so profound, it fooled us. I mean, thank God we have our brothers and sisters that are up a ways from us, if you know what I mean, galactic-wise, that are, are helping us, you know, giving us a little tap on the shoulder. We're here, you know, helping exactly. us to wake up. You're giving us a yeah. little jump start. Thank God. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Yeah, and... Uh, it's very profound, but even even if you don't want to do what I do, just listen to them over and over again. Every time you listen to them again, you get something new out of it. And it's every time you get a revelation, I call it a revelation or an aha moment, mm -hmm. uh, you're, you're growing in vibration, and your vibration is changing. It's really good. Really, really and good. It's, a, it's a situation where once, once a, there are particular doors that once they're open, they can't be closed again. I mean, 9-11 is a good example. When you have your paradigm pinged, when you're presented with a piece of evidence and you can get past the cognitive dissonance of, of realizing that you've been shown something that's at odds with everything you've ever learned, once, if you can step past that point and accept that what you're looking at has to be examined further because it's contradicting a major belief of yours, yeah. you can't close that door. You just can't. I mean, that's what happened to me and I've... I've talked about the um, the photograph that I saw back in 2009 that just shifted my reality in a moment that was that was a you know an amazing looking back on it was an amazing experience it was uh, you know twinkle the walls crashed eye. down twinkle yeah, of an twinkle eye the walls eye. crashed down <laughs> and I mean for you we do have you been awake all your life or no. did you have an experience I, well uh, it started, okay, I traced it back, remember the question you asked me? The very first thing I believe it started with was, because I come from the Christian realm and the Catholic mm -hmm. before that, it was when a man of God who was deep, I mean, out of the box of Christianity, but still taught in the church and stuff, I went to his website, and his website, I clicked on a link, and it, and it went to that pastor in Alaska that worked with the bad guys. What's his name? Ah. Uh, Yes, I know the fellow. His um, name will come him. back to me in a moment. He the did a lot of work thing. in the oil, in the oil, the oil industry. Yeah, yeah. He's a pastor. Well, I listened to him, and that led me to Lou Rouge Pack, the guy that mm -hmm. ran for president back in the seventies, and who's awakening the young ones. You know, they're like a political agenda, but he's awakening them to the real history of the United States. There, I learned mm -hmm. about the bad guys, and then I cried one night. I said, "Okay, this is bleak." God, this is bleak. Is the bad guys? Is there any good guys? And there goes my journey in buying the direct and the and all that. But um, yeah, I just want to say that sometimes it, it, it's hard to find the videos, so I posted them all, 20 of them, on the Diamonds Forever 31. Blogspot. If, if they're all in one spot, and um, they're amazing. Are uh, you talking? You're talking about the videos uh, again from from Andrew? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the, the actual, the, the best way to find the whole collection is to go onto YouTube and do a search for creating 5D. That's just the word creating with 5D at the end of it. That'll take you straight yeah. to the channel where they're all actually present. This, this is the, the actual yeah. spot they're all held in too. Well, so, yeah. good place so to you know, I've tried that many a times. They're making it hard for us to find. So I, I don't want to advertise, but I was just letting everybody know it's all in one spot. So if you have trouble mm. finding them, mm. okay. And then no, I didn't realize from there. people are having people are having trouble finding them, are they? And be careful as you listen to them because uh, sometimes if you find them on YouTube in the block, there'll be like one show missing if you're not paying attention to the number you're missing. Like I almost missed number fourteen, which I got startled when it turned on, and Chris was not the one in the ch or not Chris, but uh, who's the guy who's doing most of them? Uh, Lance White uh, is, is the person. But Lance, yeah, Lance. Lance, you weren't in the chair. Somebody else was. But I would have missed that one. Now, all, all of them were profound, even with the other guy, with the three of them. Yeah. Interesting. So. Yeah, no, I haven't, I haven't reached number 14 yet, so I'll look out for that one. Very interesting. Yeah. But look, and there's a little, thanks for a little surprise at the last one, too. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Okay. Um, Excellent. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say something about Teal. That lady brought that up. Thank you for saying all what you did, um, you know, about the muscle testing and being responsible. That's, that really makes sense. But on Teal's website, there's all those products she said with her that you can purchase, T-shirts, everything. There's like 100 products or more for each of her artwork. If you go on her mm -hmm. website, you can purchase that. Yeah. Yep. And then just a little testimony, you know, regarding consciousness change, and you see it all over the news right now. But um, <laughs> I'm telling you, be careful what you desire or what you think, because it happens the next day. <laughs> I'm saying Yes. Yeah, look, I've had the uh, I've had a number of conversations with energy workers who are who are saying that we are so close to what they call the zero point, that is the point where the the event kicks in, uh, or at least you know some an, an energetic aspect of the event kicks in that um, you know they're almost expecting it at any day, and it's. Um, very, I mean, there's such a wide range of perspectives on, you know, exactly what's going to happen next and and when. Um, it's actually quite extraordinary, and the uh, virtually everybody, and you probably find the same thing, Elizabeth. Virtually anyone who's paying attention to the um, to the alternate media and to all of the stuff that's going on, it um, are feeling that that the shift is imminent. Uh, are you getting that, Elizabeth? Well, I, the sign I'm looking for from listening to Andrew and others and what it, up till then is the standing up of the people, like in the same numbers as the 60s and 70s, and, you know, like the Syria thing. And I believe it's going to be like a process, waves, waves, finally it'll come to a crescendo. I like to hear people that were in the hippie ages back in the 60s and 70s. I've been trying to find some people that were prominent in that age and, and doing that. Uh, how it really panned out, you know, what made them all stand up? Was it one thing or was it a lot of things? So, you know, that gives us a clue. But I'm hoping and I'm hoping it's not going to be the standing up in the middle of the winter because <laughs> I'm in Minnesota, you know, it's cold in the winter. Yeah, that would, be, that would be a cold thing to do in Minnesota in the wintertime is stand out in the, uh, stand out in the streets. But, but the, 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 yeah, look, the event is clearly related to what we do. Okay, and not what the system does. Absolutely. So it's how we think, how we thought, how we, our thought. Yeah, and there, there's going to be that hundredth monkey moment, that seven billionth monkey moment, where a some particular thought will sweep around the collective. It'll it'll be a triggering thought, and uh, we won't miss it. Everyone who's in the alternative media will be absolutely galvanized by it. And to a degree, the energy that sweeps out from the alternative media and the people who are participating in, in this whole block of thought that's going out there will be one of the, one of the, one of the ignition points for that energy. You're talking about that like energy. one of those clicks, like one of the well, clicks, it, like December, 20, December 21st. I had a profound yeah. one of those. Yeah. Yeah. Look, and I and I think it's it's probably it's not going to be related to a date that's been mooted by somebody or an event that's been been foretold, Absolutely. or it's going to be something completely out of left field, and everyone will just go whoa, <laughs> and it will be like a Mexican yeah. wave, you know. It'll, and it'll I think literally dreams are already starting. Like yeah, I believe dreams are already starting. You know, with the children, they can. And I've heard lots of testimonies about dreams too, but they, the children could be dreaming already, they're just not talking yet, you know? So. Mm. They, uh, they, they are grossly underestimated in this process, I think, the, the children <laughs> are, are, are not being listened to. Oh, and we're going to be amazed. It's just, yeah, it's just part of, the, part of this process, you know, we're, in a sense we're going to be discovering our own inner child in this Absolutely. process. It's something that keeps coming up in, in conversations, is that, that oh, kind of childlike aspect. Yeah. Well, like, you know, Teal is very profound in healing. If you got, well, I would just want to give my two examples about thought and thinking. Okay, my son is really bad. He's rude. He blah, blah, blah. So it's like I'm pulling out my hair like, ah, you know what they say, uh, 
energy vampire, stealer, vampire, whatever. So I just, mm -hmm. yesterday I said, okay, what can I do? What can I do? Well, I went to Teal's website and stumbled the first six shows on her YouTube website, answered my questions. Oh, my God, it's so profound. And it's about thought and more than that. My son got fired from his job yesterday. He came home. The, the people at the job gave him some leads, and, and it was very stupid how he got fired. And it's the system, the court, and all that system. You know, mm -hmm. they did a double whammy on him. They don't want you. They don't want you to succeed. You know, so he came home the day he got fired. He came home, made his first call. On the first call, he got a job, and he's working at a better job, where the owner owns businesses on this whole block by a college. Wow. So did he? Did he learn from that? That you know, one door closes, another one opens. Did, did that occur to no. him in the process? No. Mm. But he must have been determined. I'm going to go get a job. I'm going to get a job. And boom, the first phone call. Because he's a worrier and anxiety are usually. And by the way, the job that he got fired for, on the first day of his training, he was a telemarketer. First day of his training, the very first person he called live, he made a sale. <laughs> I mean, there you things go. are going on like that, yeah. So. Yeah, look, the, the manifestation aspect of it is... is um, one of the other things that the energy guys are uh, telling me that uh, you know manifestation will become almost instantaneous. So yeah. you, you're quite right. We have to be careful and conscious about what we think and the choices that we make. Yes, <laughs> very good. Go, but Teal's really good to learn that, and she's simple. Yeah, yeah. So everybody go to her YouTube site too. That's really good. So love you, Chris. Excellent. I didn't mean to stay so long. No problem, Elizabeth. No, look, we're, we're, we're filling in rapidly here. What I'm going to do is take us to a break now. I'll see if Andrew's contactable. Um, he is at the airport, and uh, at some point he'll be getting on a plane. Um, the phone quality when I called him before the show was shocking. There was really no way we could have, could have held a conversation. He was hoping to get better reception at the airport, so I'll give that a shot. But after, if if uh, if he can't come on after that, what I wanted to do was run through my explanation of how the world works, uh, just to put it out there for this particular audience because I don't think you've heard it in detail yet, and uh, I'm hoping it will assist those conversations you're having with people around you, who are sitting there wondering why the world is such a crazy messed up place. So. Uh, I'll, I'll thank you for, for your call, Elizabeth, and for, for, your, you. for your energy and your time. And you too, I'll hope we'll, it, that's my, it's my privilege to be doing this. So, so I'll pop you back on hold and we'll uh, play a little bit of music so people can actually go grab a drink. And uh, I would like to play this. I'm, I keep playing this song. I'm quite, quite enamored of, uh, of how it how it makes me feel. So, um, one more time at least. See you in four minutes. And we're back. This is the Galactic History Show. And where I'm sitting right at the moment, it is 7.13 a.m. It's Wednesday 11th of September 2013. And I hope wherever you're sitting, you know that the the, um, the future is actually looking like I'm viewing it, which is amazing. And I hope you're knowing what I'm feeling, which is that uh, this shift that we're all anticipating is going to be so much, so much better than uh, than we can possibly even imagine. That's my intent. So, just spoke to. Uh, to Larry Bazell, who's who's one of Andrew's uh, close assistants, they're actually getting in the car and they're on the way to the airport. They're apologising profusely for the timing overlap. They, they, um, as as a group, they are actually, if you like, in the flow. They're actually sort of moving from situation to situation, as as they arise. And in fact, they're on their way to Los Angeles. They're on the way to Los Angeles to, to actually put in process the idea of, of doing a, uh, a trip around the U.S. And, and actually having it 
filmed and trying to make it part of a reality series to introduce the galactic historian concept and the information to the mainstream. That's what they've jumped into next. So a very um, it's a look. It's a a very worthwhile thing. Um, you know they they know people who have have contacts. You know they know people who know people, and they're going to jump straight down and work on the next aspect of pushing this information out to the mainstream because that's in fact what it's all about. So I'll be talking to them in about fifteen minutes. Um, they're going to spend a little time on the phone with us while they're. Um, either in transit or at the airport. Hopefully they won't be shifting bags while we're talking. But we'll be able to catch up with Andrew and a little bit about his plans for what comes next. In the meantime, I wanted to put some thought out there. Now, on the weekends for about the past six weeks, Myself and gentlemen, uh, you probably rec some of you will recognise these names. A gentleman called Brad Smiths, another called Scott Bartle, both Australians. Scott's from Perth. Brad's from my hometown, Melbourne. Have been doing a show with a couple of other characters. Um, the host of the show, his name is is um, is Danny. And uh, oh, actually, it's Danny Brown. In fact, and Danny's been working with. Uh, working in the TV and radio industry for 40 years and pretty much done everything, been everywhere. He knows what's going on in, on, in the world. And a couple of years back, he tried to start a truth show on a little radio station called WOIC in South Carolina. And he called it Keep Talking America. Well, it, the first time he started it, it really went nowhere uh, because people just weren't ready for it. And being a, a uh, hardcore truther, he realized a few months back that people were now ready for it. So he fired it up again. And he'd gotten to know Brad Smiths. And Brad pulled in myself and Scott. And also a couple of other people. There's a gentleman from uh, the Caribbean who, who jumps in on occasional shows. Another from Germany who jumps in on occasional shows. And we've been putting forth our thought on what the system is, what it really is, and how it's how it's how we've arrived at the situation. So there's a certain amount of historical discussion that's gone on about um, you know, how the countries of this planet were manipulated, or should I say the people of the countries of this planet were manipulated into certain sets of beliefs which uh, have served the purpose of the, what Andrew calls the domination and control system for steering the entire thought of the planet to the situation we currently see ourselves in. Now, to be honest, the situation we see ourselves in is actually way better than I, th than I thought we would be in when I first started to look at the geopolitical information on the internet, say, three years ago. That was pretty scary, pretty depressing stuff. What I learned along the way was most of it was fear porn. Most of it was put out there to steer our thoughts in a particular direction. So what we've arrived at in this show that we're doing is a way of describing the world, which uh, one of the reasons I wanted to put it out there is, is for Carlos, who called in at the start of the show. It's very difficult to jump into a conversation with people and give them a bigger picture that either doesn't scare the hell out of them or doesn't cause them to roll their eyes back in, in disbelief and change the subject, shut you down. You know, We've all been there, done that as far as having those conversations, getting that response, finding it frustrating, finding that the harder you sell it, the, the more it's actually bounced, you know, deflected, and you know, the more the, the situation uh, doesn't go the way we want to, which is simply to open people's eyes. And, and first of all, I have to say is, is I like, I'm very really fond of Scott's approach, is that if you, want to, uh, if you want to open people's eyes, find the one question. There's always one question that you can ask people that will start them asking their own questions and doing their own research and, and um, you know learning to pick that one question like um, you know why is it that there's so much conflicting information about 9-11 if the original story was absolutely true why all the controversy why are there 1500 you know, architects and engineers starting up websites, putting up billboards. What's going? You know, what? Tell me. You tell me. What's going? Why is it all? Why is it happening that way? Get them thinking about the information they're receiving. 
So here's, here's how the explanation of the world goes. Now there's really two aspects to it. One is the explanation, the overall explanation of how the domination, this is, this is my explanation, how the domination and control system at its core, what it's doing, how it, how it actually works. There's a theme that it has which you'll recognize immediately when I start to talk about it. Okay? And the other is the, is the aspect of what, what is on the ground the manifestation of the system of domination and control. Now we know that there are multidimensional beings out there manipulating things from above, but we look around the world and we think we see you know, certain things in play because we were taught at school. We had maps put in front of us and names given to areas and explanations of histories and governments. We were told this is the way it is. Okay, and that's, that, that is the other aspect of this conversation. So there's really two main thrusts to it. It's an explanation of you know, on the ground what the world political, social, financial structure actually is behind the facade that's presented to us. And the other is, is the technique by which they're manipulating us, um, you know, intellectually, emotionally, socially manipulating us to only pay attention to the paradigm they're presenting. Because what they're in fact doing is simply limiting the scope of our perceptions to one paradigm. And if you listen to the interview with Teal and Andrew, uh, one of Teal's views is that the, the, as a result of the event, we will have an infinite number of, of, of perspectives that we can explore unfettered, uh, which I will certainly look forward to. But at the moment, we're being presented with one. So as far as the on the ground effect, uh, and the, the world's a very confusing place to look at. If you've been observing politics, and information sources for a long time, you'll realize none of the world makes sense. We set all these things in motion. We, we, have, we, we shift massive, we, we purportedly shift massive amounts of resources to places that need them, yet they're still poor. We, we have elections where we, we elect people who say they will fix the problems and they never do. And we have massive movements to, for the, from the people to have peace through the world, but we never have peace. The United Nations doesn't work. The financial system keeps bumping and failing. The, uh, the press doesn't appear to give us the truth. So why, why, you know, what's going on? And the simple fact is the world is one corporation. It's one thing. Now I've arrived at this point through, through the work of um, folks, folks like Scott Bartle and Brad and uh, they're people close to me, but also all the massive, you know, amazing researchers around the world who've, who've gone through the legal system particularly and realized that all the companies are corporations. The things like the UN, it's a corporation. Foundations, um, political parties, corporations, they're all companies. What do companies have? Uh, they usually have some kind of physical assets in a physical industry, a, f a physical um, in inventory. They have employees and they have owners. That's the kicker. My country is a corporation. I don't know who owns it. But I do know it's a corporation because it's registered in the Securities and Exchange Commission, I think it is, the SEC, in the United States, it's actually registered as a corporation with its headquarters in Washington DC at the Australian Embassy. And if you look up virtually every Western country, you will find they're registered as corporations. But none of their owners are actually stated. Now, most probably the owner of this country is, is the Queen of England because she was the original sovereign and she would have been the one that acquiesced to the corporatization of it. The corporatization of countries mainly occurred after the deliberate crash of the stock market between the First and Second World Wars. The bailout deal for those bankrupt sovereign nations was to become corporations behind the scenes. And in essence, it wasn't that the, um, the countries themselves became corporations, but they were bankrupt and the corporate entities that stepped in were actually receivers. And we've remained in receivership ever since that time as bankrupts and have been prevented from paying out the debt which was imposed on us as part of the bailout. 
So we've actually been kept in a state of um, absolute control by corporations. Uh, in the case of this country, it's it's 80 years. It happened in the United States just after the Civil War. That was that was a political um, failure of of Congress to and Senate to recognise what was going on, and the original Constitution was replaced with a corporate version. So if you look around the planet and you and you want to know what's going on, the invasion of Iraq was a hostile corporate takeover. Iraq was not part of the system. They sent in the corporate enforcers, known as NATO, and, and the military forces of countries, including mine, and they actually took over that country and they put in a central bank and it's now part of the system. And Libya was the same, hostile corporate takeover. Syria is the same, hostile corporate takeover. These, these, are, these countries have resources that are, and they're valuable and the system wanted to control them. At the same time, the system makes massive amounts of money out of these wars, spreads fear, maintains the mean that, that the world's full of enemies that must be fought. Uh, which brings me to, my, to the second part of this. I'll just conclude the first part by saying one of the simpler things you can tell people if you want to make sense of the world and you understand that your government's a corporation, that it has owners, and that those owners are, in fact, co-owners of, of corporations planet-wide, that there's actually, it actually all ties back through, through lines of ownership and control, back through boards, back through shareholdings, back to a very small number of people and companies. In fact, it, it does go back to people in the end. If we could drill back through the public records into the private records, because that's where it becomes difficult, we would simply find that it probably goes back to a handful of people. They could fit in a room and sit around a table. One of the, one of the um, aspects of the control of the media industry, for instance, is that there's purportedly five companies that publicly own all the media on the planet. And in fact, I've been told it all goes back to one. There's a company called the Bennington Group that you won't find anything about anywhere on the internet who actually control those five companies. And that's where the media is controlled from on this planet. That's just one example of if you went through almost any aspect of what's on this planet, you can drill back to a very small group of people and there'll be a small board of people on the Bennington Group who call the shots as to what goes out on the media and what doesn't. Now, the, the insidious nature of this is that it's concealed. It's concealed behind the apparent, apparent um, countries of the planet. Well, you know, they're, they're countries. They're, they've been around for a long time. You know, my country was supposedly, um, uh, you know, had a federal government brought in in 1900, you know, 113 years ago. Uh, yes, that's all very nice. And that's what I was taught. That's what I believe. That's what we're sold at school as being the thing. And it's not true. It's, it's actually fiction, it's a lie, it's put in front of us from the moment we're born and we, we actually take it on board as truth. And until we're presented with evidence such as the stuff that we've dug up in the last few years, you just can't, you can't tell that it's a lie. And it is. And the other thing that they use is division. This is a really simple aspect and it blew me away when it was first really pointed out to me. Um, we're, in, we're in what a uh, gentleman in Australia called Franco Collins, a legalist, calls the Roman cult. And the creed of the Roman cult is divide and conquer. So how do they control us? It's by division. Just division. And if you look at everything planet-wide, they have divided us and set us against one another for thousands of years. And the division starts at planetary level. You know, we're divided into you know, what they're called nations. And the nations are divided into states. The states are divided into counties, into cities, into suburbs, into streets, into your house. We've been categorized and filed and socially speaking, we have been divided in every possible aspect of human life. We've been divided culturally through religion, through sexuality, through the colour of our skin, through the location we live, through the money that we, we, you know, how much money do you earn, which sports team do you follow, which political party do you follow. It's division, 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 division. Everywhere that we look, we are divided. And one of the aspects that's come out very strongly from this show is that we're divided from information about our bodies. We don't know what our bodies can do.
And everywhere you look, if you look at a, at a conflict on this planet and you start to look for you know, what's really going on behind it, look for the division. Over, and if, specifically, if you see it overlaid with, a, with fear, fear of conflict, you know, fear of attack, you're looking at the system. It's being divided. So, you know, in the show, Danny actually uh, was was wanting us to talk very much about Syria a few a few weeks ago. And my view is Syria is another act of division. Right? It's being sold to us as a racial conflict, as a political struggle, and it's just the the system of domination and control inserting division and fear into the collective. So, if you look back at 9/11, uh, it divided us. Okay, it set um, the the Western world against a particular aspect of religion, which for a long time now has been developed as uh, you know an enemy to others. It's division, all the way down the line. That's all they've been doing is. That's why my radio station is called One People's Oneness Radio. The the cure for this division is in fact unity and sovereignty. And when we start to find that leadership from within and we step away from accepting the information is presenting us with reality and we create our own, then we have freedom. And as I think Elizabeth said, Elizabeth said earlier, uh, the process of, of the people coming to their feet is what we're really looking at because that is the moment where the division is actually removed. That moment. So, it's just gone half past the hour and I hope that helps people in their discussions with others. Uh, it's a really simple argument because it cuts straight through all of the local politics. You don't have to explain how it is that the Republics and Democrats are the same thing. You know, you, you, your, your argument is simple. They are corporations and all the corporations belong to one thing. If there's just one thing out there, it's one entity. And that's really the sum total of the effect that those multidimensional beings that Andrew uh, has taught us about have had on this planet. They've put this system into place. And it, it, it's just behind the scenes, it's one thing. Loosely connected, uh, subtly connected, but always present. And the division... Is, is, is again inserted into our thought, into our civilization from the moment we're born. And, uh, you know, just one aspect of it is the concept of hierarchy. Okay, there's always a hierarchy present in every aspect of this one thing that we're looking at. We're taught to not question authority, so the hierarchy always works. So there's some thought to digest. And... Uh, uh, it's a discussion I have frequently, as you can tell. So I'm going to I'm going to try giving Andrew a call here, and uh, see if we can get him on the phone. Ring, ring. Hopefully, we'll get straight through. But this is live radio. So we won't know. Okay. Hey, hello. Hello, Andrew. Yes, a moment. Ah, it's Larry. Hey, Chris, how you doing? We're doing fine. We've just been having a good conversation over here. You made it to the Very airport. Very cool. You made it to the airport. Not where on the. On the way to the airport, we're on the road to the Hui. Should be about 30 minutes trip there, maybe 20 minute trip there, and we got to drop the rental car off and uh, get to the airport. So I got maybe 20, 25 minutes until I got to drop the rental car off. Excellent. Well, look, we've been having a conversation about the usual wide variety of things. 9/11 itself is is sort of prominent in people's thought because of the date, and other questions have been posed. Would you like to uh, jump straight into questions? Um, did you want to tell us sure. more about what's happening with you? What would you like to do? Hold, hold on one second. Yeah. All right. I may, I may drop your call here in a second. Can you roll that window up? I just got a lot of echo in here. Um, 
what's going on with me is what's happened is the first womb gate, uh, womb, the womb chakra in Syria has awoken, and it awoken on Tuesday this week. Um, and the irony of that is if you look on the news, you'll see uh, kids that are being on gas attacks on the public, te uh, public television and in all of these what I call bad gas moments where the reality itself can't really function, and all it can do is show the proper propaganda at its fear point value. Now, you referred to Baghdad Bob, I think, Dave. Broke up just a touch. Baghdad Bob, I'll just yeah. remind folks, was that um, functionary inside the Iraqi government that was proclaiming uh, that the, the Iraqi army had successfully beaten off the invading armies whilst there were um, NATO tanks coming down the street behind him. Uh, in other words, propaganda that's so obvious, it's hilarious. Right. And, and uh, for anyone that watches the news, what have they been showing the last seven days? Endless amounts of videos of people going through sarin gas to capture their eyes glaze over, little kids and convulsions and vomiting. People lined up in hospital rooms or makeshift morgues, all dead from sarin gas attacks. And Emma, if you look at those videos, you really look at those videos with your heart, your real heart and not the etheric programming, you realize that those are not live footages, that those are not footages of the Syrian people, that those are really not real videos. They're all inaccurate. So... Uh what we what we think is going on, that is, the information is partially untrue, is actually not quite correct, that it's all being fabricated. Well, the reason it's being fabricated is because they can't convince anybody that there's nuke weapons of mass destruction. So they're showing them, which started by Saddam Hussein using gas, gas weapons on his own people, and they're trying to rehash that patriot part of the program of people here in the United States that go out and stop the big bad guy, when in fact this is just like weapons of mass destruction. It's a fabrication. You know, they tried to, to shove fabrication down our throat with the second Gulf War, and people didn't buy it right away. But it's the patriot program that turned us back into the war machine. And it's the patriot program that's being triggered by those videos. Now, the patriot program, you've said in the past, Patriot program is particularly effective. Correct, because you're working on a nationalist concept that goes back to a constitution that has soul family relations to it about being a free country, when in fact your vote really means nothing. Every time you vote, 505 people are determining what 380 million people deserve. That is not representative government in any way, shape, or form. But the banking industry, where not one single person has gone to jail, from the 2008 banking scandal. Not one person. You know, right, right there is, is absolute evidence that the system only ever acts to protect itself. Correct. Right there. Now, you spoke a moment ago of the womb chakras, in the, in a, room, or a womb chakra opening in, in the Middle East. In Damascus. In, in, Damascus. in Damascus. There's actually a, a cluster of 11 that are right in the in the Mediterranean area. And the first one went active under Damascus. The second swoon chakra went active under um, Mount Fuji. And uh, a third one has become active and then became passive. And when I say active, it is like when a woman starts her menstrual cycle, there's that little tingle that the body says to the mind, something is going on and we're having our cycle beginning. This is the very beginning of a menstrual cycle for Earth, the one that's been held back by the amount of violence and war above those womb chakras. Did you say there was one in, one in Mount Fuji? Correct. The one in Mount Fuji opened up um, about 25 minutes after the one in Syria opened up. And then there was a third one that went into, to go open up in the Bahamas, and that one was paused also because of the amount of violence that's going on in China, because there's a China womb chakra, there's technology over it right now that's preventing it from fully opening. It's only at about 6% open, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of interdimensional operable technology, as well as a series of timeline incursion events that are going to go on in Jingshua, China. 
Uh, for anyone that, that's out there that's a news watcher, start paying attention to the Chinese news, news feed. And what you're really looking for is the propaganda. The propaganda will tell you everything. You can read through it because you know what propaganda is. Now, the womb chakra openings uh, sound like they're pivotal towards the energetic situation moving forward. All the people that will live above a womb chakra will go through a rapid cellular and DNA transformation based in their dream world. So the core purpose of a womb chakra is a Earth's original purpose to be a galactic seed planet where those people that live on those areas are able to create life in a mass form and then bring that mass form of life to another blank planet and begin terraforming it at a soul level by bringing entire you know, continents of trees within a few days to be planted on the surface of a planet, an entire ecosystem of rivers and microorganisms all being delivered in a period of a few weeks so a planet goes through a rapid transformation because you're bringing literally the soul from the planet Earth that has been bonded with the tree and then that tree is being bonded to the new surface of another blank acacia record world and that blank acacia record world is inviting brand new souls to come and live in it so that they can begin the brand new experience of a planet. That's Earth's original purpose and the 200 womb chakras that are on Earth are to aid that process of mass mass transportation of uh, plants, animals, vegetables, um, anything that can bring sustain sustenance and life to other worlds on a mass scale to seed planets to create new forms of pineapples or coconuts or hybrid all of them with the will of the planet because you're bringing sham shama shamans that you know how to create, set up reality bubbles. All the things that I've been talking about the awakening here except that's a starting process on another planet. Right, and it's going to be applied to us first, obviously, to reawaken Correct. this world. So the people will suddenly learn how to farm perfectly. The people will learn how to get along. Um, the people that are in the womb shoppers that have Oracle in them, they're the ones that are going to be, have the most amount of resolution done to them right away because they're the ones that need it. They're, that is what domination and control has put as its pawns on the surface of that. And Earth can wipe the board clean of all of those pawns by awakening them all and starting a chain reaction of soul family density separation, where those that are forced into this war scenario, because many, many, many of them are in a dominated re reincarnation cycle, those people will suddenly find that they don't need to be there, simply do not need to be there. And when they fall asleep, they will be looking for their ancestral relations to the dream world of Earth, and Earth will put them in communion and union with the healers that can begin healing them so that they can locate away or bilocate away from those areas and go through the separation of density of soul family. Hmm. They're so, the first wave of migration that goes that gets off the world. Right. The process is starting to become clearer to me and I hope and I hope to the audience that the, of what's actually underlying this whole awakening. Geopolitically, if you observe this geopolitically, um, the, the, the information you're putting forward um, will only become clearer later in the process when the geopolitical stuff is out of the way. So a question for you at the moment, Andrew, is that in continents like the United States and Australia, how many womb chakras are in those locations? Are there, are there, are there chakras in, in, in every in continent? Australia, in Australia, there's 31. Mm -hmm. But a couple of them are under the water near the Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big line of them that are there. Um, because that's also a womb chakra. There's a number that are near Antarctica. So Australia has the access to the most amount immediately, like within a long boat ride or a super long helicopter ride or, or a jet that, you know, as long as they can land somewhere, you can begin activating and functioning with those womb chakras, which will radically change the surface uh, energy uh, grid of Earth. And then... It's about finding the control rooms. You know, we haven't talked about those recently, but there are 40 control rooms. 21 have been taken over by, the, by both good, bad, and neutral. And there'll be the separation of density of all those walk-ins that I've been telling you that are coming in. We had 200 million walk-ins come in on Tuesday. Wow. 200 okay. million. Ooh. Okay. So that's 200 million, 200 million living humans who who are part of the system of domination and control who now are no longer part of the system of domination and control they have walk-ins in them 
Now the walk All the walk-ins are going to do is go, to go through a six-day adjusting period, a seven-day adjusting period, where they adjust to the new contract. These are the shock troops of, of, of the, the Galactic Central Sun. These guys are not, are not nobodies. They've done domination and control so many times, they volunteered for the most difficult position of all, and that's D-Day. So uh, in, in six or seven days, just to clarify one thing, when you say walk-ins, you're not necessarily meaning that a different soul will walk into a body, but, but a large chunk of their higher self will actually come in to actually, if you like, um, you know, the way that um, Peter and Michael put it is, is to increase your soul mass, your consciousness. It is both. Uh, it is both. There okay. are those that put themselves in as resistance pre-Earth, as a cell of one, who chose to be activated during D-Day. And there's their higher soul has been in training, observing the world on a dream world, a dream, dream grid, or a geopolitical level, and their higher self is experiencing this world through the perceptions of the of the I am self, and as the I am self gives way to the fact that it's open, the resistance cell is open, the womb chakra is triggered, the rest of the contracts clear out, everything that's domination and control, and it returns that that soul to the Earth original reality format. They become temporary reality programmers, and many of them are going to be your doctors, your lawyers your firefighters and your police officers worldwide. And the purpose they're being put in at this point in the game is to disrupt the flow of puppetry communication between the highest sources and the ground sources that may be given orders to open fire on a public to start riot. Indeed. So they're putting good people in the chain of command so the chain of command is broken through domination and control. Because all domination and control can do is react. It's a set of programs that trigger cultural responses, and those cultural responses they put in there are zealots, so they go and follow through on those actions. Would that include the media that have been walked in? Correct. Yes, yeah, so. correct. The media. So there's two things going on in the in the in the groups that, that I work with at the moment. One is a, a, a pushing on the door of the media to to print the truth, and the other is pushing on the banking system to recognise that the people are the value. So it would sound like the That's timing right. the timing of these exercises is spot on because if these walk-ins are in are going to be fully functional six or seven days from Tuesday, uh, then from last Tuesday, then um, was it a week ago that this happened? Yep. Okay, so they're pretty much ready to roll. So now's the time to move and and actually you know, take advantage of that change of the game. They're, they, they're already moving. They're already working to do what it is that they do, which would disrupt communications from the highest forms of puppetry to the lowest forms of puppetry. Now, the other side of walk-ins are people that volunteer to be alive here now and to enter government, whether they're an army general or a private that, you know, cooks food. doesn't matter. Once they're in the system, they're in the system of domination control, they have access to the inner dream grids of those command structures and can act as uh, dream saboteurs to prevent programs from being opened up on a massive dream scale so you could activate, you know, 10 units of the American nuclear facilities to go active. And to their minds, they are dreaming a real and event and scenario and could launch whatever it is that they wanted because the system is using the sacred geometry dream cities to make them act so that they can fracture disunity reality and make it harder for the walk-ins to take over the next phase of the Dreamtime event. Earth is going to go through the separation of densities, which means the older souls will collect to the older souls and younger to the youngers and the middle age to the middle age. And once that process is finished through the dreaming, the elders will split with the young and youngers and the, and the middle age will split with both sides. And then you'll begin the search for soul family in the dream time. This is at the stage, like in Walking in Energy 3, where I said there'll be the children at the breakfast table at high school or junior high, which is before they eat breakfast. You know, they'll be sharing dreams, or at lunch they'll be sharing dreams. And one will go, why I had the same dream, and 10 others will say in the same period of the day, the same dream. And that'll begin what's called a whisper campaign. And that whisper campaign will spread throughout the Internet as people begin to share videos. 
on a more of a adult scale, you'll be sitting in your, your cubicle and the person next to you will go, oh my God, deja vu. And then you'll have deja vu of them going deja vu. And then somebody sitting next to you will go, oh my God, I had deja vu of your deja vu and your deja vu. The latent in your face things that are represented of the infinite dream world bleeding over to the finite existing you. And of course the, the thing we need to bear in mind is, is um, just because someone's a child doesn't mean they have a young soul. Right. It's um, now you call this the, the 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 splitting of the densities, and this has been this has been described um, by many people, or at least aspects of it have been described by many people of, of the Earth becoming like like two or three different Earths. Um, in actual fact, we'll, we'll all be in in the same place on the same planet, but starting to share different realities. Is that a more accurate description right. of it? Well, my bubbles of realities will begin to form and those bubbles of reality will transform the surface of Earth to its highest vibrational state and still allow other bubbles of reality around it to not be rapidly affected by the higher vibration entities that are there. So if a low vibration entity or lower vibration entity wanted to enter a high vibration realm, it would just have to go through a little bit of an adaptation period. And when it wanted to leave, it could return to its own realm and then go through a adaptation period, as could any of the higher go to the lowers. You set up rules for high energy being come into different energy environments. And that allows all of those realities to be fully expressed. Um, uh, here's another example of the, of the dream world. You could find yourself dreaming during the day or during a nap and find yourself in high school reliving an event where it was traumatic for you but at the same time, you're counseling yourself about that. And that's something that recently happened to Helene here. And I'm relaying that story because it was important for her because she asked me exactly, is that what the separation of dream worlds is about? And I told her, yes, because you're reliving yourself, teaching yourself. And you can literally find yourself in both places at once. And don't let that be a, make you afraid. It's your opportunity to realize you're a multidimensional being that you're living all of your past, present, future lives simultaneously. And it is the I am presence you, the one who makes the physical choice of what skin layer of past, present, and future life you're going to express. In, in people's experience, um, do, you, do you expect that most people will start to remember aspects of past lives clearly and recognize them as um, past lives? Yes. Um, the thing is, when we're born, we're ripped out of our ambionic sac and, and given a slap on the ass, 22 injections, and stuck in an incubator. They've broken love at all angles there. Well, what else they've done is taken the ability for you to remember your past lives. Now, we know that when you come into this world, you come in a blank slate. Well, there's a fundamental rule of the reality that says if you're taken out of uh, your opportunity to remember up to 5 or 30 percent of your past lives, and that is the mother and father sharing part space during new transition phases that baby from the ambionic sac to being fully separate, to being separate from the umbilical cord, to being on their own, to being breastfed. And that cycle right there is what completes that soul's chance for remembering up to 30 or 40 percent of their past lives. Now imagine how different our world would be would reincarnation even be possible if we remembered 30% of our past lives? It's hard to imagine what that would be like, actually. Right. Difficult. Difficult. How could they trap you in a reincarnation cycle? They, they can't. Yeah. They can't even put fine print in your contracts without you going, hey. Where did that come from? Exactly. In, 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 a, in a properly functioning Earth, you know, we've been going, we've been having past lives for tens of thousands of years, some of us. There's people have been here for a long, long time trapped in this cycle. If the Earth was functioning as it should, how many lifetimes would you actually live on this planet? A handful? Oh, so that's a really, really, really good question. Um, and the answer is thousands and thousands and thousands because the experience is so much more incredible than other worlds. Hmm. But it would so be a so matter much more incredible than other worlds. But it would be a matter of choice rather than being trapped here. Right. See, the thing is, 
many people, and this is, this is my educated view of the Akashic records and what the world was like in between domination and control breakages where teens lived here, they would come here and live a tremendous life, so rich and fulfilling and experiencing, they'd leave the next lifetime to go back and bring more people here. Oh, okay. Okay. okay? Yeah. But they're, they're, they're leaving and coming back would not affect the linear time in which they, they were incarnating in. So they could go to another world and live a million years and come back to Earth like they had never left. Yeah, yeah. That's the experience that's different. There are linear time observations that have to play on other worlds. You know, the big thing about incarnating on planets is you may be looking for a person that's on the planet, and they may leave. They may get on a ship and go somewhere. And if you're incarnated there and have soul contracts with them or ancestral karma, then you can't find them. And on Earth, you come back at the exact point you need to be in everyone. You've never left. So the Earth, the so Earth is in with the change of experience. Yeah. So that's that's a partic that's a particularly unique aspect of the Earth, is it? Yes, because of Earth's dreaming mind. For Earth to be able to send DNA wisdom and DNA objects to new worlds, blank acacia record worlds as a seed planet, it must be able to be linked into the dream grids of other planets. So the other important reason why Earth's a, a massive target is if you own the surface of Earth and are able to take over her dreaming body, you can dream invade up to hundreds of millions of other worlds tune the planet's open mind into worlds that haven't even been created yet so that they could transfer DNA wisdom to them because that's Earth's purpose. So literally, Earth has access to millions and millions of other planets through the Dreamtime grid, and that's because those are brothers and sisters, nephews, cousins, and uncles to Earth when she still had a physical body. Is that why the Earth was, or one of the reasons why the Earth was quarantined, so that couldn't be done? Correct. Correct. Yeah, because that would be a very, very dangerous thing. That gives you access to, you know, half this universe, I would suspect. More than half. It gives you access to the spots that aren't, aren't even created yet. Wow. Because it's linked into the Prime Creator's exchange of uh, wisdom between the youth, youth or age of souls. It's literally a part of that between an interuniversal exchange because there is, a, there is a need to exchange sentience from one universe to another to another to complete cycles. And then there are people that are nearing the end of their cycle in this universe and cannot go on until Earth is finished. And there are other universes in the same series. It was a big bottleneck. There's going to be a tremendous amount of flip over of beings that are one, two, and third degree separation of the prime creator in this universe and other universes. Many of them will be forced to port it, and others will simply realize their mistakes and, and honor their, their duties as they're leaving. So the, the, At the torch to the new elders. So it isn't just the other races that that we're aware of that are that are part of this universe. You know, the, the Syrians, the Andromedans, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that are that are waiting for this graduation. It's actually affecting other universes as well. Correct. Okay, so because that, Earth's capability of reaching out to so many worlds at once, and then you put timeline genocide on a system that's meant to create brand new DNA. Are the timeline right, here's an example. Here, here's an example. There was a species that came to Earth during the second rise of Lemuria, and the womb chakras were fully open, and they made a very, very special, um, we'll just call it like, like head shrub, like, you know, like in France they have the hedgerows. Yes. Okay. And these things would grow all over the planet. And they'd grow in them into sacred geometry, and they'd grow them to basically grow, gain sentience because they were a massive hive of organizations. And they could connect to them in such a way that you could bring younger life into them and share dream space within them. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really hard to describe, but these, these shrubs became a massive, massive part of other worlds because they adapted to lower sentient planets really fast. They raised the vibrations fast. It was an incredible inven invention. Well, that timeline of that one person who went to that one planet who brought that first you know, round of seeds back to a new world got erased. Uh. That means everything that uses that plant of the technology gets erased too. 
one degree of separation. So that's and that's, that's why Earth caused literally creation to come near an end. That's just one example of the things right, that have happened. That's one example of the many of the many timeline incursions that have erased things that weren't supposed to be erased. Have the timeline incursions stopped? Because it sounds like they're still going on. They're going on here on Earth because Earth is the foundation of all of them, and this is the the foundation is what they're targeting. That's not about what happens halfway through a captured time, and that's pointless. You have to get to the foundation to erase it. So it's still going on here on Earth, and it's being done by forces here on Earth. Is that correct? Both good, good, bad, and neutral. Many of them, what they're doing, are in this endless cycle of, of countering each other's move. But it's not happening from the other planets that are, are, are you know, literally were creating timeline incursions to try and become first species. Correct. It's all everything that everything that's being using timelines is here on the planet. So there's still a lot of move and counter move going on at a, at this local level. Correct. What's being played out in the micro? is a reflective of the macro. Okay? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. In all and every case, look what's going on geopolitically. Okay? Yeah. And let's, let's transvert that, translate to that macro. So Obama is an Obama. Obama represents the hope of a unified action. doesn't matter if the, if the information is right or wrong. And you have 5,383 species all unified to help in their own separate unity consciousness to maintain a quarantine at a proper way so Earth can go through its awakening, at the same time removing many millions of layers of multidimensional technology that is in a fortified Earth, nine layers of pyramid fortification. So it's a tremendous, tremendous reach to do this. Is there any other particular aspects of what's going on currently that are good examples of the micro and the macro? I mean, Obama's a good one. What about the Pope? Um, what about the Pope? Very, has he, has very, he when Putin, the Pope, I'll get to a second, in, in a second. Putin yelling at Obama and Obama yelling at Putin. That is an example of the Pleiadians and the Orions and Syrian faction realizing that some of the people that they've put in charge have become zealots. And the upper parts of the political organization that is in unity consciousness has realized that there are subcultures of unity consciousness that are withholding information to unity consciousness in whole. And that's the most detrimental thing to any unity consciousness is the pockets of information that are withheld. Fascinating. So anything that's okay. going on, anything that's going on politically is simply it's reflected at a greater scale around us. Right. So, okay. So Example, the, the actions of what goes in our world are like the breathing of lungs. So the CIA is, is a big chunk of a lung. The, the, the Russian version of the other KGB is another version of the lungs. What's going on in London may be the colon or the sphincter. Ha, ha, ha. Yep. <laughs> so on and so forth, representing the body of expression. And the womb chakras are the representation that Earth's going through a menstrual cycle that's been withheld by a planetary scale. It's a pretty pretty straightforward relationship, really. So the Pope is actually playing what role in in the macro? In the macro, that's the other dark forces that are contract holders because they're the puppeteers, the off-world puppeteers. Okay. And the Pope is representation that I'm the puppet. But they're on live puppet. I'm talking through this this vessel, and there's a realization that there isn't one person in control of the Pope. That yeah. he's he's a sellout, and it's always been a sellout for whatever layer of multidimensional entity that's going to take domination and control by the hands and say it's mine for the next 20 years. So somebody kicks me out of the power. Yeah, Andrew, it's. Uh yeah, we've just passed past the second hour. Um, unfortunately, we'll have to have to wind the show up here. Uh, I, I have a um, need to not get off my schedule too much today. Really glad you could make it in for this last half hour. It's been absolutely fantastic to jump in with that information about the walk-ins because that confirms a whole lot of. Uh, a whole lot of things that are going on should need to do and need to keep going on. 
Is there anything you wanted to just put in to, to kind of put a full stop at the end of today's show? Um, I'm going to tell people to turn off the TV. Mm -hmm. And I mean really turn off the TV. This is your opportunity to turn off the etheric programming, to, to broadcasting, to turn off the Facebook, to turn all of that off and just feel the earth. Just feel the earth. You're at this vital, important time where you got to feel the earth. It's, it needs your dream attention. So before you go to sleep, vision, visualize the North Pole, the Aurora Borealis. If you need to go get a YouTube video of it to burn it into your mind, please do that. That is where your ancestors exist. That's where you get to create a spiritual court of equity, which is a fundamental rule, law, built into this reality. So you may find remedy and resolve to any other action in this reality that is affecting your free will. It is where you declare your free will in front of all your ancestors. And it's your given right by living on earth to do this. You're referring then to... Tell yourself before you go to sleep, I dream with the Earth Mother in the, in the Aurora Borealis. Lovely. And of course there's the soul contract revocations to cement this in place. Yes. I encourage people to make their own. You, you know yourself better, better than anyone else. And you know what your habit patterns and addictions are. You can revoke the habit patterns and addictions. That's fantastic advice, actually. I know Hope Girl has actually been writing her own the last week or so, and she's finding that partic just the act, the act of writing them is as important as the act Absolutely. of saying it out loud. So, yeah, look, I thoroughly encourage people to do that. You know, think of the North Pole. Um, I've just realized that you know, certain things I see in my head when I'm, when I'm drifting off to sleep, which actually are the aurora borealis it's actually i've realized that um, the green lights that i see when i go to sleep are actually probably that exactly interesting and that layer has always been there for you there are times where people look back when they were a child and you close your eyes and all those colors and swirls and everything and you'd ask your parents what other and uh, that's just the stuff you see when you close your eyes no that is the entrance to the dream world that is how your your eyes perceive the un, the invisible layers of the dream world, which is likely Aurora Borealis, which if anyone has ever seen, has streamers and patterns and things that explode. And it's just like looking at your eyelids when you're a kid. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant connection. Andrew, thank you so much for touching base. I hope the trip goes well. We'll catch up with you in Los Angeles in a couple of days' time. And hopefully yep, Nick, on Nick Thursday. You, on Thursday. Yep. Nick will be on the yeah. show. And, uh, I believe so. We'll have to find out. Sorry, what was that again? I, I'm not sure about her schedule, but we'll find out. She should be there. That would be good if she could be there. Yeah, we've got things to talk okay. about. Okay. Look, you have a great yeah. trip. Okay, you too. And we'll see you in uh, on, on your Thursday. Thursday. Yep. Okay. Take it easy, everyone. Love you all. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Andrew. And to all the listeners out there, sorry we had to kind of chop that short, but... Um, we do try and keep this to as close to two hours as we can. I can hear my little companions urging me outside that their walk time is due, and I've got. I, unfortunately, I have uh, uh, some other things to attend to in my morning, so I must not not push out the show too much. But thank you very much for hanging in with me. Uh, thank you very much for those to those who called in and joined in the conversation. Very enjoyable. Good information as usual. So uh, I hope you'll join us in a couple of days' time. I've got the Long Conversation show tomorrow on One People's Oneness Radio at this same time. If you'd like to join us there, we've got Julian Wells on and then a political scientist, an ex-professor called Anoka Shiva, and we'll be talking about community. So I hope you'll join me then, and I wish you have a great day. Bye for now. <laughs>